Hello and welcome to your podcast, Classes Off with Rosa. This is the show where you'll find reliable data to help you find solutions to common problems. I am your host, Rosa Antonini. Have you noticed how technology is changing everything that we do? Over the years, technology has transformed how companies conduct business today. Many individuals get attracted to this field not just for the financial perks, but also because it can be very challenging and exciting. These days, more women are getting into multiple technical areas among all industries. But how can a woman be successful in this most demanding field? Today, I am so excited to have Rachel Blom, a super successful woman in the STEM field. She is a principal architect and field CTO at one of the most powerful cloud computing-based data cloud companies. She has worked in the data technology for 25 years in various roles, including consulting, professional services, product management, and sales engineering. Rachel is a published author and inventor with several patents in the cloud technology. So Rachel, welcome. How are you doing today? Wonderful. So nice to be here, Rosa. Thank you for having me. I can't wait for us to have this discussion because there's so, you know, this field is so interesting and it is so challenging. And especially for women, I believe I can wait to see how you were able to overcome all these challenges to be able to hold so many powerful positions how you have had. Um, so can you tell me what made you choose a career in this field? Yeah, so it's interesting. I didn't actually choose uh, to go into this field initially. Uh, I was a graduate student studying public health and I had to take a statistics class. It was part of the, you know, the required course curriculum. And, and I, I fell in love. I'd never taken a statistics class before. By any chance? <laughs> what was that, Rosa? I'm asking, were you good at math? You know, I was really, I was, I was great in math uh, when I was uh, in high school. And I went into college, uh, actually pre-med, uh, but I didn't stick with it. I just, you know, at the time you know, it wasn't for me and I, but I had intended to go into some science and math field and just kind of switched course when I started college. So it was interesting, you know, and then I went into public health and it was interesting to kind of come back to it. And I found that that's kind of happened over the course of time that uh, things that you're interested in, you, you do tend to come back to. Um, so it wasn't surprising per se that I was, that I, that I was good at statistics, that I loved it, um, but that mm -hmm. I never... I'd never taken a class before in it. And, you know, the entire time I was in school up until grad school is interesting. Um, but I was hired uh, as a statistician uh, for a, a startup uh, in New York City. Shortly after I started, my boss asked me if I could very quickly learn SQL and a business intelligence tool. It wasn't called business intelligence at the time, um, but, you know, a dashboarding tool, you know, within 24 hours so we could go present to a potential customer. Uh, and that really launched my entire career in, you know, SQL development, uh, data architecture, uh, and, it's, and it's largely been what I've, what I've been doing for the last 25 years. Wow. And I imagine in 25 years, you have seen a lot change in this industry, right? Because it's always changing and it's changing fast. But it is also uh, known to be a male-dominated field. So what has been the most complicated challenges that you have to overcome to become a leader in your industry and how were you able to cross those barriers? Yeah, it's such a great question and one that I'm sure we could spend hours talking about. Uh, it took a long time, frankly, for me to figure out how to be successful in that environment. Um, starting out at a young age, uh, being seen as credible was challenging, having nothing to do with my capability, but, you know, both a combination of age and gender. Being the only woman in a room is challenging. There's, there's no one like you there. Maybe there's a camaraderie that's happening that you're not necessarily a part of. There are behaviors that... When you say camaraderie, can you explain a little bit? You know, I think... It's the case that sometimes people like to work with people like them that have similar interests as they do. And, okay. you know, there is an aspect of all companies where fit is a concept, right? Do you fit? And that can be a good thing. It can also be a, a, a not great thing. Um, 
you know, the, you want to be able to get along with the people that you work with. But if that becomes exclusionary, then that's not a great, that's not a great okay. thing. Mm -hmm. um, again, being seen as credible, uh, being treated with respect had, had been a challenge, certainly when I was younger. And I think that I've had to learn to manage other people's behaviors in a way that maybe, uh, that maybe men don't. Um, I feel like I've had to really monitor my own behavior with people so as not to come off as threatening or oh. too, uh, quote unquote, bossy. Uh, and I certainly think, you know, if there's, I, I have to, there's some, some masking techniques I've used over time to, to be taken seriously, but not come off again as threatening. So I, I, I certainly think that's been an aspect. And once you've learned how to do those things and navigate how other people react to you, uh, that I think has, has led me, you know, over the course of years to, to much greater success, but it certainly took an effort on my part to make that happen. Okay. Let me ask you, Rachel, you hear a lot in the different industry, not just the technical one, about the differences of pay between salary for a woman versus a man when they are doing the same type of roles. Do you experience that? Do you see that in the technical field or is it a little different? I haven't experienced it, but that also may be because I've always had a concept of my value. A monetary value for an organization. That's um, very important. It is. And, and, so, and, I, and so I believe that it happens. I certainly believe that there is a pay gap uh, based on gender. But a lot of that has to do, I think, and this is not victim blaming, but, you know, teaching people the confidence to negotiate an appropriate salary uh, okay. for the work that they're doing. So again, that's, it's, it's work uh, that has to be done. Uh, but I've had a lot of, I feel like I've had good success um, doing that. So it's not been something that I've found particularly impacting. Um, and frankly, there are so, I, I think there are still so many fewer women in technology that that actually adds to your value, right? And if, if, if an organization wants to diversify, um, then knowing that there's a smaller pool uh, to choose from really, I think, enhances your value to an organization. And these are just important things to think about when you're negotiating your salary, when you're starting a new, a new job. And I think I've always taken that aspect very seriously. So for, let's say for uh, the listeners and maybe people that don't feel, they don't have that, the same confidence, right? And maybe they feel tied into this position and they are either scared to move or scared to ask for a raise. Uh, what would you suggest to someone in that position? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And, and, I, and I, if I had more time, I'd probably give a more thoughtful answer. But I think if you just think of it from the perspective of you may question your value, you may have it, it, imposter syndrome, you may think that everybody else is smarter than you or better than you or more technical than you. Um, but likely that is just absolutely not the case. If it's the case, maybe that somebody is more technical in one aspect than you are, you're probably more technical in another aspect. Uh -huh. uh, maybe you have other specific skills that you bring to the table. Uh, you know, maybe you're a better communicator than others, a better writer than others. Um, so comparing yourself to other people based on some assumptions that you're making that you know probably nothing about in terms of what their capability is versus yours is really a waste of time. Knowing how much, how much companies are willing to pay for the work that you're going to do for them is a much more important metric by which to ask for a particular salary. And frankly, the worst that can happen is they say no. I think that women struggle with, more so than men, is my, is my guess with not wanting to ask for too much, right? Mm -hmm. Not wanting to seem braggy, you know, superior. But I don't think that men struggle with that same feeling of, you know, inadequacy maybe that women do. That's my, that's my perception. This is, you know, anecdotal. I haven't done scientific studies on it, but not, yes. I think the key thing is to not assume that other people are better than you and that you're worth the money, all the money that that company is willing to pay you. And you don't know what that is until you ask for it. Makes, uh, makes great sense. Rachel, let me ask you something. This, this is a very fast paced field. How can you keep uh, yourself relevant? right? How can you keep learning all the time? Not only that, so let's say, for example, if you become a doctor, 
all the years of experience that you accumulate looking at different patients, right? They all adding up, adding up, adding up. But in the technical field, that is a little different, right? We know that some technology, they can be very hard at one point and all of a sudden, that's it, they're gone from the market. Yeah. So what, what, what have you done to be successful throughout the years? And also, what is what you will suggest to other people? What is what they can do to keep themselves relevant? Yeah, well, fortunately for me, I, uh, I'm really interested in constant learning. And I love, uh, I love a good challenge, right? I love to not know how to do something one day and then know how to do it the next day. So it's not been difficult for me to kind of, you know, to really keep up, as it were, with technology. And I got some really great advice from uh, a boss many years ago, uh, because at the time, you no, know, I was younger. I, there was something, I knew, I knew one thing really well. Uh, and I, you know, I spent a lot of time talking about it. And in fact, he said to me, he's like, this thing that you do, it's, it's the Rachel show. And he didn't, he didn't bring the compliment. <laughs> um, and he said, you know, there's a fabric of things and you know, one tiny piece of this, uh, of this fabric. And you really, you know, if you want to be the person I know you want to be and have the career you want to have, you really need to, you know, know what you don't know, um, and strive to know it. And so I've always followed that guidance. Um, and you know, I, I, I like to spend time with, uh, in a very cross-functional way. I mean, one of the things I think that has made me the most successful at the job I currently have is that I take the time to spend time with people that do a lot of different things at my company, understanding all of the aspects uh, and their perspectives. And that's what helps, you know, expand that fabric of things you know, uh, you know, versus the things you don't. Um, and I think I, I love that advice that, that you got when you were young, because it, it sounds like you can apply to everything, right? In all aspects of your life. And in a way, it, it almost also keep you humble, right? Because it's like, okay, you never learn so much that there is not much to learn, right? Absolutely. And, and that humility is great, although... Uh, you know, to the topic that we're that we're talking about, mm-hmm. I don't know that women need that much more humility, right? Like, <laughs> you think that's you know the challenges knowing, being able to know that you don't know everything and constantly striving to learn new things and not fearing, not fearing not knowing something, right? Like having the confidence to say, I don't know this thing, but I'm you know I'm I'm certainly willing to learn it, um, but also not feeling so humble that you think you don't know anything correct right just humble it's good to have the like humble for from the ego perspective but not from the negotiation perspective 100 percent, absolutely yeah so rachel this is a very demanding work right and sometimes it takes nights sometimes it can take weekends so is there an impact on the family life when working on this field and what can younger mothers or mother-to-be do to maintain a work-life balance while building this successful career? That's such another great question. And again, also, we could talk about this for hours. You know, I think one of the key things is defining what balance means to you, because it really does mean different things to different people, to different mothers. Um, you know, I think that there are, you know, there are people that want really to be home every day with the kids. Uh, you know, when they get home from school and and do their homework with them and, you know, really have a, a very hands-on experience. And there are mothers, you know, like myself, that really just like love working. I love doing children, but I really love working. And I'd, you know, rather outsource, you know, some of the, uh, you know, homework help type things. Um, okay. But I think, you know, the point there is really it's defining what balance means to you, what happiness is. And then... Mm-hmm learning not to be stressed out about work when you're not there. And that was really one of the hardest things for me to, to figure out, like how not to take work home with me, uh, not to be stressed out, uh, upset about something uh, when I was actually spending time with my family. So really a matter of what does it mean to you? Not again, comparing yourself to other people and what they're doing. Um, and, and not, and really learning to let go, you know, whenever the end of the day is, whether it's at midnight, uh, you know, or if you're working through a Saturday on a Sunday. But I think the other really important aspect of this is learning to set proper boundaries and not just boundaries, but proper boundaries. Because to your point, 
you know, uh, careers in technology, they do sometimes require really long hours. And there may be emergency situations. Uh, we're not saving lives, but mm -hmm. there are situations where we're weird hours. Maybe we have meetings, you know, with Asia and we're, so we're on the phone at one in the morning. Um, so you want to be able to commit to your job and, and do a great job, but then not let other people take advantage of you when it's not necessary. And that's Correct. an interesting learning. Like, what is that line of uh, when people, when, when you're just really committed and doing a great job and you're making the choices versus other people, um, like sucking your resources uh, unnecessarily and putting you like at a disadvantage? Yes. And that, that's a good point, Rachel, because I think it depends also uh, different cultures. Like I heard at uh, one point someone saying that the people needed to be working for that person because that person was paying their salary. And I thought that was um, kind of unfair, right? Mm -hmm. that, that statement, because that a lot of people, I, I mean, I come across a lot of professional, especially younger professional getting into, you know, testing the waters. And there is a fear factor sometimes where they think that they have to work a little bit on eggshells, not to break anything. And somehow some of them feeling guilty, like just to ask for what is right for them. You see, so what would you say about that? Yeah, I, and it's a really good point. I mean, I, I say this like I've mastered this, but it was really only a few years ago, I mean, a year ago, that I was actually able to get over the fact that I never want anyone to ever say that I don't work hard, right? It's completely mm -hmm. how I identify. So if I say no, then what if they think that I'm not a hard worker? So, uh -huh. which, is, which is different than... Um, maybe the person then who's managing you is just not a good manager, right? If they're not respecting your ability to deliver in a way that's re respectful of your time, uh, if they're not, if you're not being treated like an adult, then that is, you know, potentially a management issue. Uh, and I can't change the, you know, the way that all people work or the way that all managers manage. Um, mm -hmm. but I do, I do hope that we are shifting to. Uh, especially in the field of technology. And I, and I think we are, and it's what I see where there's a lot more autonomy for people and certainly you know, working remotely changed the way that people, you know, in, people interact on teams uh, and with managers, but uh, to where there's more autonomy and people are given a little bit more freedom and choices about, you know, when they spend their time doing the work mm -hmm. as long as the work is getting done effectively. Yes. So let me ask you about gender. Do you believe that during a job interview should maybe on the resume, should it exclude the candidate's name? That way the gender won't have an impact on the interview process. And I know not during the interview, right? Because by the time of the interview, you know already the person you're speaking to. But I'm talking the process where you're selecting, where you're getting all this resume. Uh, does having a name matter to drive the decision of who's going to get the interview or not? That's, that's also, I mean, all your questions are so interesting. Um, I tend to say out of the, the area of hiring, um, it's just not something that I, you know, I like to, you know, write code and not spend so much time uh, interviewing people, uh, although I do. But I, like, I think that's a really interesting point. Um, would, do people already make a judgment when they look at someone's name? Of course they do. Of course they do. They, they start to picture what this person is, uh, how they behave before they've even met the person. So I do think there is some, some value in, yeah, hiding someone's name and other identifying information, just looking at the criteria of their experience, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, to get sort of past the, that first, that first phase of, uh, you know, of recruiting. It, it's, an, it's an interesting point. Let's say a lot of resume don't get into the right hands, maybe because, and not because it doesn't look good and it doesn't have the same experience. If you compare the two, it's difficult to know why one is selected versus the other. So I don't know. Let's see. Let's see where that question, if someone, uh, I don't know, if they start doing that in the future, that would be interesting to see. It is. And I think, you know, I think what's interesting, too, though, is, again, anecdotally, is that it, because there are so so many fewer women in 
technical roles that recruiters are always really trying hard to find them. It may actually be advantageous to women in technical roles, uh, you know, to be, you know, that it's known that they are women because organizations are trying to diversify, uh, you know, in those areas, especially in engineering, um, in engineering roles. So I don't know, maybe, maybe it is even advantageous uh, at, the, at this time, although maybe it wasn't 25 years ago. And let me ask you in that sense. So if you are a strong professional and you have, you know, the value that you bring to the company and you are very uh, strong with your skills, will you like to be higher because the company is trying to match a number of diversity or would you like to be higher because of the true value? Yeah, absolutely. The true value. And, you know, because if you're hired, if you're hired based on a company's desire for diversity, then everyone's going to assume that your skill set is lower and you were correct to meet a quota. So and, and, you know, you and I have talked about this before. It's it, the, the con that concept of diversification is really tricky. It's really tricky because you want to bring in the most highly skilled people and it may diminish the perception of the people that are being hired you know, if that's the case. So I, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a gray area for sure, Rosa. Yes. If someone is studying college right now and they are considering going into the STEM field, what would you, how would you, or what could you tell them that will help them figure out if this is the right field to go? What type of questions or what type of, I don't know, how someone, like if you see yourself when you started in this field, what helped you figure out that this was the right field for you? You know, I wish that I could say that it was all in my brain and I had a great master plan and I just like, and I just, you know, kept climbing this ladder. It was a very linear journey, but it really wasn't. It was frankly uh, a lot of, you know, things that kind of happened to me um, that led me on this path. So I'll give you, I'll just give you some quick examples. Uh, at my first job, I was hired. It was a, it was a startup. There were very few of us. Um, and so we were in very senior positions and we were managing things, you know, running the show. Uh, and after my company was bought by another company, I said, oh, hi, I'm Rachel. I'm a manager. And they said, well, we don't need managers. So we need you to go be a developer. And I felt well, like I'd been demoted and I took, and I was, I was really hurt, but I went to go be the developer and I realized, and I love coding. Right. And that has a, happened a number of times over my career where I get promoted, company gets bought, they need developers, they don't need managers. Um, and it really became clear that my passion was so much more in coding innovation, architecture, solutioning versus management. So I, I think it's going to be a combination for people of finding the things that they love, but then also, you know, experiencing life in the workforce, like, you know, getting jobs, losing jobs, getting promotions, realizing you don't like it, do, trying something else. Um, so a lot of uh, trial and error, you know, over the course of time, whether it's by your choice or someone else's, that will, you know, hopefully if you're picking up those lessons as you go, you'll find that perfect sweet spot of a career that you love. And I think that's what's happened for me. So Rachel, I think what I'm hearing too is that you're saying to those younger people that it's okay not to have everything figured out when they are I don't know in their late teens or 20s or coming out of college that it is okay that they don't have to feel just because some younger people getting into the field they see social media and they see everyone look to be so, so successful and they put this high standard to themselves and all of the sudden they feel that they don't even want to try sometimes to go from one company to another because they think that, oh my gosh, I don't have what it takes. So what I'm hearing you saying is like, it is okay to be right where you are. Sometimes what we want is not what's best for us. If you lose the job, it's okay. Just keep going, right? And who knows, maybe those things that you really are trying to get so hard right now, they will take you to different path that eventually is really going to put you into that passion that you have just like it happened to you right yeah that's exactly right you definitely don't need to know everything how could you at that age uh know everything in every kind of job there is um everything you could potentially learn in school or 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 at work 
you know, the thing I, I say to my own kids, I'm like, just, you know, don't worry about what job it is that you get out of college. Just get a job. Just get a job. Um, learn a skill that will get you a job. Get a job. Do that job. Um, learn from it. Figure out if you like it or not. Um, if you don't like it, maybe there's another job at that company uh, that you might like that's a little bit different. Um, but at least you're, you're in. And if not, then now you know you don't like this thing and you can at least you have some job experience and you can go do something else. But I think making this long grand plan, especially in technology, where, again, it does just change so often to your much earlier point, it, it, it changes so quickly. It makes no sense to make this long term plan. I'm going to be this because this uh -huh. is not going to exist a year for a year or two from now, um, you know, and to be it's so important what you just say, Rachel, because you were just saying like what you say to to your kids, right? And I was listening to you and I'm like, wow, it feels relaxing. So imagine if I'm listening to you and it feels relaxing, imagine the way that, you know, they take off their shoulders, just thinking like, it's okay. You don't have to have this 20, 30 year plan and you don't need to just, you know, you can always change. So I think that is really helpful for someone studying in this area. So yes. Rachel, we are almost at the end of our show. So any final remarks that you want to give to our listeners? Yeah, I just, I highly encourage people. And again, this was something that I learned over time that disappointments go away, right? Um, if you work with people that are difficult, you'll learn from that, that will pass. Um, you'll get a job, you'll lose a job, uh, you know, that, that being upset about that, that will pass. And there's always another opportunity around the corner. Uh, and I couldn't have imagined 25 years ago that I would be in the position that I'm in, you know, loving my career, loving my job as much as I do. I know things can change any day, but I'm confident the next thing would come along, uh, and would be, and would be absolutely amazing. So really that's it just you know don't let the disappointments sway you just keep keep moving oh that was great thank you so much rachel again for being with us today this was such an interesting and helpful session and i hope everyone will benefit from all your experience and advice that you have acquired over the years so if you want to know more about rachel you're going to find her information right in the podcast description and remember, coming up, we will discuss more topics on mental health, our education system, global warming, self-development, and much, much more. Please share and subscribe so you don't miss any of them. Thank you so much and see you soon.